There are a few things more shameful than the equation or the substitution of politics for sympathy. The idea that you don't fully respect someone's loss or tragedy unless you're willing to put more power in politicians who promise to stop it next time. Good guys agree with me and bad guys don't, so don't you dare disagree or you're disrespecting the sorrow. But there is no more basic respect I can give you than respect for your fundamental rights. And so too goes the reverse. The most serious attack I can make against you outside of outright killing you is to sabotage them. And that's not just a moral truth, but a practical one. There's a compelling argument that more freedom, not less, would have alleviated the problems that led to the Buffalo shooting. More speech could have moderated the views of a guy who was otherwise without company or challenge in the darker corners of the internet, corners that we have created by banning speech instead of engaging with it. And even if that speech didn't work, more defense rights could have stopped this guy before he ever claimed as many victims as he did. As far as I'm concerned, censorship and gun control are 0 for 2 in this case. So even if you're unconvinced by the freedom side of the argument, sometimes it's best just to try something new. The definition of insanity compels it, and besides, the success rate can only go up from here. It's the moral thing to respect your neighbor's rights. It's the practical thing to respect your neighbor's rights. It's the baseline good guy thing to do. That's what makes it so ridiculous and shameful to take lectures from people who would diminish or revoke those rights about how actually you're the bad guy. Even more shameful still when the smearing and the opportunism aren't even based in the facts of the story, just lies invented into it, which is exactly what's now happening with Buffalo. The tragedy has been attached to the agenda machine with a few hasty strips of duct tape lies to hold it all together. And it starts with the biggest lie of all. These are people who will tell you all about how much they care while showing they don't care at all about their own word. They swear an oath to uphold the Constitution and then spend their entire career betraying it. And we're supposed to believe that the promises they make to us will get us treatment any different. It started on Sunday with New York Governor Kathy, I am your vaccine messiah and you are my corona apostles, Hochul, kicking off the constitutional betrayal by trashing the First and Second Amendments in response to the shooting. And it continued on Monday with New York Senator Kirsten common sense speech control Gillibrand. And yes, as we'll get to later, that is the actual phrasing that she uses, even if you're not a gun person. Notice how the logic of the rhetoric against your self-defense rights copies and pastes right on over to your speech rights at their convenience. That's why full support of the first requires full support of the second. They attack two to make one more vulnerable because once two falls, one is defenseless. It's exactly the argument sequence that Gillibrand used in that MSNBC interview on Monday. Start with the second, move on to the first, right after she and the host congratulate themselves exactly as we started for being such good people because they want to remove power from citizens and give it to politicians instead. I want to know what you can possibly say to a community like this as a member of a body that hasn't done anything on guns. And I know it's not for lack of effort from many on the Democratic side, but the Republicans have blocked any real effort to pass universal background checks, do anything to, to regulate the gun market. What do you say to a community? What do you say to any place where there's a mass shooting in this country when nothing seems like it matters. Starting off immediately with a lie by implication, the premise being that a background check was absent or would have otherwise made a difference in this case, not true. The shooter in fact passed a background check to purchase his rifle legally from a New York gun shop. Additional federal background check law would have accomplished absolutely nothing in this case. But of course the facts are obstacles, not points for understanding. And so Kirsten Gillibrand happily joins in just making it up to suit the agenda. It's exhausting to go over and over about the fact that this was an assault weapon, the same assault weapon that was used in Sandy Hook. The fact that this shooter was allowed to cross state lines to get a larger magazine so he could shoot not just 10 bullets, but 30 bullets. It shouldn't be publicly available. That weapon should not be able to be purchased by anybody. It is a weapon of war. Okay, this is either a New York lawmaker both former state and current federal, who does not understand her own state's laws, or she's just a liar. Take your pick, but 
Neither is a person to trust with the preservation of your rights or your safety. She labels the shooter's rifle an assault weapon, and yet doesn't explain if it is an assault weapon, how was it legally purchased in New York where assault weapons are banned? Well, that purchase was legal because by law, the shooter's rifle was not an assault weapon an acquisition. All these assault weapon laws do is change the shape of the furniture on the gun. A standard AR-15, New York State defines as an assault weapon, and that's banned. But this monstrosity is not an assault weapon under New York law because it has no pistol grip and no adjustable stock and no flash hider, or in the case of the rifle that the shooter bought, a fixed 10 round magazine, meaning a mag that doesn't detach and drop out. It's attached to the rifle. The state of New York, through its existing assault weapons ban that Gillibrand says would have stopped this event, says this silly sort of rifle that the shooter bought is A-OK, -okay, no assault danger. But this normal one with differently shaped plastic is an unacceptable configuration, though they are both functionally identical and will do the same damage in the hands of a person intent on it. Bottom line, the shooter complied with New York State assault weapons law at the point of purchase. He did not skirt it, and an assault weapons law obeyed, did nothing to stop this shooting. And yeah, the guy did take a few tools and an hour's time to replace a couple parts on the rifle and make it capable of accepting detachable magazines again. That is true, but good luck banning such things, unless you want to ban drills or plastic, or springs, unless you want to ban all of Home Depot for the assault weapon armory that it is, this is basic technology that cannot be erased. And that's what makes this crossing state lines argument so dishonest too. He did not cross state lines to get a gun. And if he did, that transfer would have to go through a New York licensed dealer who would enforce New York state gun laws anyway. She's talking about getting a magazine across state lines, which number one, we don't even know if that's what happened. We don't know where the shooter got his mags. But number two, how do you stop a plastic shell and a metal spring from crossing state lines anyway? These exist in the millions already. And even if you want to try to stop their free flow, they can be 3D printed with ease. This is no more sensible than saying we're going to take toy soldiers or barrels of monkeys off the street. It is plastic that is out there in volumes you will never recover. And even if you did, it's incredibly easy to manufacture. So she lies about how this shooter armed himself. Next, she lies about what might happen if you did the same to prepare. Somehow this story proves that armed citizens can't protect themselves. There will be people who come out and say in the aftermath of this that all you need is more people with guns, more good guys with guns. What Tom just highlighted right there was a security guard who tried to engage with the shooter, um, but the shooter was wearing body armor. He couldn't do anything, even though he had a law enforcement background. The police in Buffalo showed up in one, one minute. minute. So the Ten problem people are still dead. We had a security guard who acted bravely. We had first responders who were there in one minute. The problem is you have a mentally ill 18 year old who had this kind of ideation who falls into to rabbit holes within our uh, social media platforms that aren't regulated. Okay, so one guy being unsuccessful with a gun proves that nobody could have been successful with a gun, which is really weird considering the only thing that stopped this guy was more people showing up with guns, the police. And speaking of, if the police showed up in one minute and that still wasn't fast enough to stop the murder of 10, how is that demonstration that citizens should be unarmed? That is demonstration that even if you're in a densely populated area, even if the police are right across the street, it is impossible for them to respond quickly enough if a murderer picks you on the spot. That is demonstration that you are your own first and last line of defense, even if there are perfectly good and capable police officers immediately nearby. But hey, don't take my word for it, take the shooters. He said specifically in his writing that he chose to perpetrate this attack in New York and not elsewhere because there are few citizens carrying firearms. Because carrying is so heavily regulated and only those given the privilege by the personal judgment of the politicians may do it. So submit to our laws that were followed and did nothing. Make yourself defenseless in exactly the way the shooter strategized for. If you're 
catching a theme that these people want you victimized and dependent on them, yes, that is the point. And you heard Gillibrand mention the regulation of speech and social media. Well, that's the final form. Get the guns out of the way and you are entirely controllable, right down to your thoughts. Should they be regulated? Let's talk about yes, the social media platforms the shooter allegedly advocated. So let's be it's clear. It's also about Carlson misinformation. Within a lot of can you regulate speech on the internet without violating free speech? You don't have to regulate speech. You can regulate misinformation. You can say you can't yell fire in a theater. You can, there's many ways you can abrogate speech rights that are consistent with the Constitution. Oh, it's not about speech. It's just about misinformation. Well, great. Now explain what misinformation is other than simply speech you disagree with. The lie here isn't just that you can somehow control for truth or falsehood without controlling speech itself. The whole point of free speech is it is the sorting mechanism through which truth and falsehood are discovered. The lie here, again, coming from a lawyer whose job is lawmaker, whose oath is to the Constitution, is that the First Amendment has any sort of exception that covers what she's talking about. We have established exceptions for incitement, true threats, defamation, copyright infringement, and certain obscene materials, all of which are defined by very narrow constraints. But none of these are what she's referencing anyway. She's talking about opinions she doesn't like, and there is no Supreme Court doctrine to support government regulation of wrong opinions because such a thing would be exactly the sort of viewpoint discrimination that the court has long held is at the heart of the First Amendment's protection. What she's talking about would be erasing the court's history, in addition to the text of the Constitution itself, of course. Either she knows that, or she is a terrible lawyer. But I could believe terrible lawyer, because after all, her fire in a crowded theater reference is also complete legal bunk. That reference is part of a 1919 Supreme Court decision presented as a hypothetical by the justice writing the opinion, not a point of fact or part of the legal holding in the case. And even if it was, that case established the so-called clear and present danger test for speech outside of the First Amendment's protection, a standard too broad, so the court defined it more narrowly 50 years later with the incitement doctrine. Only if the speech is directed at inciting or producing imminent lawless action, and only if the speech is likely to produce that action, is the speech outside the First Amendment's protection. So, for example, hey, I have some questions about vaccine efficacy. That is not incitement. Hey, I have some questions about election integrity last time around. That is not incitement. Or in this case, hey, I have some questions about the motivations behind immigration policy. That is also not incitement. All of those Gillibrand would call misinformation, but none of them exist outside the scope of the First Amendment's protection, as she's alleging. Her proposal would mean the destruction of our entire system, not compliance within it. It's a total betrayal. Or as she calls it, just common sense. And for, again, an 18-year-old to develop such hatred in his heart through media platforms that do not have any regulation is a problem. And so we need common sense, thoughtful regulation. It takes time. It takes responsible leaders to create this. But there has to be a willingness uh, to be able to have common sense reform on all these issues. It's common sense, says the lawmaker, who either doesn't understand or deliberately misrepresents the law in her own state from a legislature in which she personally served. It's common sense, says the lawyer who has no understanding of the case law on our first law, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It is common sense, says the lady whose public appeal highlights include her presidential campaign getting passed over for a ranch dressing dispenser. I don't think you should back away from the bold ideas that the, 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 the base and the grassroots care about. Oh, sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm just trying sorry. to get some ranch. Go ahead. <laughs> only to dunk on herself with a cringe workout video to revive the embarrassment. Well, maybe there is some common ground on banning those guns, but I can't believe she couldn't ride the coattails of a condiment to the Oval Office. How could such a common sense strategy fail? The point is, common sense isn't an argument or a principle. It's a platitude, and an even emptier one when you constantly demonstrate that you have none. But hey, 
Let's take her point at its best, not its worst. Let's take the argument head on instead of lying around it like she does. To the extent that common sense is a thing, as in a commonly held set of values and traditions and behaviors, given the size of our country and the different living conditions throughout, doesn't common sense actually vary across it? And isn't that variation exactly what our system is designed to protect? Isn't it possible, Senator, that what makes perfect common sense to you in New York makes absolutely no sense where I sit in Montana? And isn't it possible that's not just okay, but desirable? In fact, crucial to protect. We don't have to agree on everything. After all, I know nothing about New York. I have never stepped foot in that state, and God willing, I never will. But if we can't agree that what happens there does not entitle national dictatorial control of what happens here, then we agree on nothing, and our union dissolves. There is actually nothing more common sense than recognizing that different people have different perceptions of that term and operating within that reality. In other words, the rest of us fully respect your right to be a New York idiot, Senator, and since you're such a good person, as you constantly remind us, it shouldn't be an unfair ask for you to return the favor. Respect our right to be misinformed rubes who are capable of defending ourselves. For all your professed sympathy, that's really the only sympathy that matters. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Parlor. that is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.